A key component of the modern world economy, the chemical industry delivers products and innovations to enhance everyday life. It is also an industry in transformation, where chemical executives and workers are delivering growth and industry-changing advancements while responding to pressures from investors, regulators, and public opinion. Discover how leading companies are approaching these challenges here on The Chemical Show. Join Victoria Meyer, president of Progressio Global and host of The Chemical Show, as she speaks with executives across the industry and learns how they are leading their companies to grow, transform, and push industry boundaries on all frontiers. Here's your host, Victoria Meyer. Hi, this is Victoria Meyer. Welcome to The Chemical Show. Today, I am talking with Rob Benedict, who is Senior Director of Petrochemicals Transportation and Infrastructure for AFPM, sometimes known as American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers. Rob has a wealth of experience in transportation and elsewhere. His previous role was at the U.S. Department of Transportation, and I know he's been pretty active even at AFPM in those spaces. So we're going to hear about that and more. Rob, welcome to The Chemical Show. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. So let's just start. What's your origin story? How did you end up working in an industry group? And I know you've had a transportation focus, although it's a little bit broader now, AFPM, but how did you get here? Yeah. So the origin story, I like that. It makes me sound like a superhero. So I guess I've always been kind of into science. I got my degree in Wake Forest University in biology and kind of straight out of college, I went and worked for a lab major chemical company, but a lab in a major chemical company in Delaware. And I had worked there. And that's kind of when I got first exposed to transportation because we had to to ship a lot of things. A lot of things could be considered hazardous materials. So I got exposed to kind of the shipping world there. I love Delaware, but I wanted to kind of move to the city. So I found a job with the U.S. Department of Transportation and a small agency called the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. And what they do is they regulate the shipment of hazardous materials and dangerous goods across the country. So I started my kind of career there. I spent 12 years there. I worked my way up from, I started in their information center that was literally a call center where people would call and you ask you questions about the regulations. And then I kind of worked my way up into helping write the regulations and also do the supporting analysis. And I guess my last kind of role there was their senior regulations officer. So I kind of walked transportation regulations kind of through the whole process from public comment to government review to publication and then community outreach. That would be really interesting, maybe in a Washington geeky kind of way. Yeah, definitely. You get to see the sausage get made and you're part of that process. I also got to work on a lot of really cool different projects. I worked on fireworks at one point in my career, doing international work and got to go to the UN in Geneva. But the biggest thing I got to work on was the crude by rail shipments kind of exploded in 2010. The the amount of shipments went through the roof with the advent and widespread use of fracking. So there was a lot of crude oil that needed to be moved and it went by rail. That posed some challenges. And part of the rulemaking I worked on was creating the next generation tank car to protect people from any type of derailment and accidents. That kind of got the interest, obviously, of the association I'm with now, the American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers. They moved petrochemicals that went in these tank cars as well as crude oil. And when they decided to start up a transportation committee, that's when I came into play. And it's been really exciting because I kind of got to be on the ground floor of them really developing a good midstream program, you know, dealing with not only rail, but pipeline and maritime issues, the whole gamut of the supply chain. Interesting. So I had not realized that that focus was so young, so to speak, within AFPM. I mean, they've always dealt with supply chain and transportation issues. They formally set up a committee in 2017. And then that's kind of where I came in running that committee. And what that did is it offered us dedicated resources from our companies, people who do this on a daily basis that we could reach out to and engage and advocate for. So what role does AFPM play in the industry, particularly looking at chemicals and petrochemicals? We're actually one of the oldest associations in Washington, D.C. We started in 1902. And while the focus originally was more petroleum products and fuels and refining, it's kind of evolved as our industry has evolved. In 2012, they rebranded into the American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers. We were previously the National Petroleum Refiners Association. That change in name reflected the change in kind of focus of the organization, looking more broadly at refining and petrochemical together. So what we do, I'd say we do kind of three things. 
advocate for our members, whether it be fuels policy or on the petrochemical side, things like advanced recycling or chemical management, things like the Toxic Substance Control Act, also infrastructure permitting, things like that. So advocate is kind of the first leg of the stool. I'd say educate, and those are kind of linked together. So not only are we dealing with filing comments or working on the Hill to get certain legislation passed, we're also educating people about our industry and kind of dispelling some of the misnomers about our industry. So a lot of our time is spent letting people know what a petrochemical is, what it's in, and how important our industry is to everyday life and the U.S. economy. And then the last piece I would say is kind of being a source of information. AFPM holds a variety of conferences. We have a really robust safety program that looks at ways to improve process safety. You may have heard of Walk the Line. That's one of our big programs. So I'd say advocacy, education, and and informing and information being kind of resource for that is what we do. And, And all that's kind of tied up in us, hopefully being the voice of the petrochemical industry as well as the refining industry. Yeah, that makes sense. And in fact, I think the industry needs a voice. As you say, and I know I've read some of the AFPM's materials and stuff that the common person and individual doesn't necessarily, they like the plastics. They like all the benefits that they have. They like the plastic phone. They like driving their automobiles. They like living the lifestyle they live, but they don't actually understand that the root of it can come from refining, chemicals, petrochemicals, et cetera. So creating that awareness is critical. One of our programs here is We Make Progress connecting the dots between the carbon molecule and the feedstock into what it goes into is is one of the big things we've been working on here at AFPM. Awesome. So you recently testified at the Surface Transportation Board about the challenges with rail carriers. Can you just tell us a bit about that? First off, it was really exciting to get to do that. As I kind of mentioned earlier, I've always been really interested in rail, both the safety side of it, but also the kind of economic side of it and as an industry. And kind of without being too long-winded, the rail industry has really changed since 1980. In 1980, we had about 30 or 40 major railroads, and we had a major legislation passed that kind of re-regulated how the railroads would be viewed, and that also included an economic regulator, the Surface Transportation Board. But since 1980, and particularly since between 1980 and 2000, we saw those 30 railroads condense into just seven different railroads. And what we've seen is in regionally, there's only kind of one game in town when it comes to a major railroad. This really affects our members. Our facilities kind of have to run on a constant basis. You can't just turn on or off a petrochemical facility or refinery. So as we've seen the reduction in the number of rail carriers, we kind of had some challenges with service. Pair this with kind of new ways the railroads are looking at running their business, focusing on cutting costs um, and maximizing revenue. Pair that also with the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been in a situation where we're seeing as customers of the railroads, very much disruptions in service, increased rates, service days. We used to be served five days. Maybe we were only served three days. So a lot of challenges. As AFPM is, we're a free market as organization, but we've seen kind of a deterioration of the free market in rail. Um, and that's where the STB comes. So it was really good for us to be able to have this hearing because it shows that the regulators are recognizing there is an issue. And it also was an opportunity for not just AFPM, but other different industries to kind of voice our concerns. And not only how it's impacting us, but how that in turn impacts the consumer, whether it's the price of a petrochemical good or a gallon of gasoline. Yeah, it's interesting. And in fact, I had not realized those numbers that we used to have 30 railroads down to seven at this point. Although I should, because my kids make me play Ticket to Ride, which if you've ever played that game and, you know, they get pretty stealthy about what their railroads are and who controls it, which I guess it's a good proxy for real life. Because I know certainly when I was working at Shell and Clarion, rail decisions were tricky, right? Especially when we looked at facilities that were sole sourced from a rail company or, I mean, a lot of products across the chemical industry are considered hazardous and have different criteria. And that's just gotten extraordinarily expensive to move those, those really necessary goods. With our facilities, we're kind of seeing it on both ends. In, we bring into our facilities feedstocks like crude oil or natural gas liquids. So we're relying on it there. And then we're moving product out of our facilities. We ship over 2 million carloads as an industry every year. We rely heavily on a good rail network and, a, and an efficient rail network. So while the hearing may have seemed contentious to some, we want everybody to succeed here because when the railroads do well, we do well as well. Well, and I know AFPM is really advocating for more competition. 
which rail is pretty capital intensive, right? It's not easy to build new rail. It's a very expensive undertaking. Is it realistic to get more competition into railroads? It is a capital intensive industry and there's not going to be a new major railroad built overnight. We're not expecting that to happen. What we are advocating for is some policies that would reintroduce potential competition back into the network. Specifically, one thing, if you saw the hearing you heard a lot of was reciprocal switching, which would allow at an interchange you to transition from one railroad to the other. This would create railroad to railroad competition, we feel, and improve the network overall. Also, with the lack of competition or if there's only one game in town, we need that regulatory backstop so shipping rates aren't escalated to a point that's not fair. So we're looking for just a fair system. We have no des- no delusions that they're going to build a new railroad, and we don't think they should. But we do think that there's a role of government to play to make sure that when you're single served, like you mentioned, you're not going to be really kind of put in a position where you have no negotiating power and kind of take it or leave it mentality. We'll be right back. At EcoVist, they're accelerating the transition to a sustainability-driven future. Their long history of innovation, expertise, and customer collaboration supports the development of proprietary catalysts and services across their two industry-leading businesses, Advanced Materials and Catalysts and EcoServices. Advanced Materials and Catalysts is a leader in proprietary and customized technologies for polymers, cleaner fuels, emissions control, and circularity. EcoServices is the largest North American recycler of spent sulfuric acid. EcoVist, your catalyst for positive change. So what do you see happening next? What's been the outcome of that hearing that you participated in and where do you see this going? So the hearing, I believe, was the 26th and 27th of April. And just in early May, we saw the STB kind of take their first step. And what they did, and I think this is a great idea, they required certain railroads that were having some service challenges to develop service improvement plans. And part of these plans would say how you were going to address hiring, how are you going to address operating, on-time performance, things like that. So that's something in the short term that I think transparency, accountability, that's going to provide it. They're going to have to report this, I believe, on a biweekly basis. So if they're not improving, people are going to see and the regulators are going to see. On the longer term, the Surface Transportation Board has been incredibly active. There was a period of there while where they didn't do a whole lot. You didn't see a lot coming out of them. That might have been a function of more healthy and workable rail environment. But in the last three or four years, we've seen efforts to look at rate reform. So how you would challenge a case if you think you're being unfairly treated. There was efforts to expand the amount of data that the STB gets so they know what's going on in the network, particularly in the first and final mile of a trip, which is where we see a lot of the issues. So those are two kind of big things. I think the reciprocal switching is something that the new administration is definitely interested in. It's been mentioned even by the White House press secretary. So I think you could see something there. We're very busy and so is STB and we appreciate their kind of renewed focus on this area. I think our hope is that we have some short-term fixes with what they've done right now, but that we might have some long-term fixes that could keep us from getting into this issue where service is deteriorated to a point that is really impacting the economy. So we don't have that happen in the future. I think that's great. And I think certainly since the start of the pandemic, supply chain has become a household word in the way that It never was before, right? So everybody's aware of supply chain challenges. And of course, the rail industry is right in the center of it. It moves so much product of all varieties, finished goods, raw materials, et cetera. Where does marine transport fit into this? And are you guys engaged in that at all? Because of course, that's the other thing that we're seeing a lot of is just disruption constraints from marine. So with this containers that are coming to the US that are trying to get onto a rail car, containers starting to leave the US, it's sluggish. Yeah, so the supply chain, you know, only is as strong as your weakest link. And, you know, obviously, I'm not calling maritime the weakest link by any means, but there are maritime issues. And it's kind of interesting because it's a similar setup and situation to the rail world where we've seen a lot of consolidation in the rail freight industry. And we also have an agency that's kind of to be the watchman, the, the Federal Maritime Commission, similar to the Surface Transportation Board. We've really partnered with other trade associations. I think you talk with Eric Beyer at the National Chemical Distributors. ACC, as well as the American Chemistry Council, we signed on to a couple different letters to the Federal Maritime Commission. 
asking for them to look at ways to address exorbitant rates or detention fees, things of that nature. Also, there was the Ocean um, Shipping Reform Act. AFPM didn't actively advocate on it, but we do support a lot of the principles that are in there. On AFPM's side, we have been focused a lot on permitting, particularly widening and dredging ports. You have your container ships, but you also have your ships that ship crude oil or natural gas or refined products, and they're all competing for this same port space. So wider and deeper ports, and that requires a lot of time in the Army Corps of Engineers. So we've been really focused on making sure that that permitting process goes through well. Do you guys see movement there? Do you see the permitting process moving out in that space? Or accelerating? There is definitely interest on the water side with the Water Resources Development Act passed a couple of years ago. And I, the new version of that was just passed. A lot of it is kind of getting beyond the government bureaucracy, which I think some of the more recent legislation has done. Permitting on kind of the pipeline side is kind of the counter to that argument, where we've actually seen it probably get harder to permit a pipeline, which is a completely different issue, but one that our members are very interested in, nevertheless. Absolutely. I mean, in fact, I hear when I talk with clients all over the different parts of the value chain that permitting is a big issue. And and I think it happens probably every time you go through an administration change and there's different points of view get that get brought in and different people. But it's certainly the timing of these permitting issues and kind of the slowness in the system has not been great. Yeah, you definitely see kind of the regulatory whiplash between administrations, and we've seen that. I think you are seeing a little bit more focus on moving energy products, particularly in light of some of the energy supply issues related to Ukraine. That's unfortunate. That's what's bringing these conversations up, because ultimately, our members want to move materials in the safest way possible. And streamlined but robust permitting is kind of the best way to do that. We're definitely going to advocate on behalf of that and continue regardless of who's in office. Absolutely. And the safest, most robust way, in many ways, the most sustainable way, right? So I know greenhouse gas emissions, sustainability, the whole ESG landscape has really changed and really has accelerated over the last couple of years, right? So it's a key topic in the industry with people I talk with and work with. And yet, often, I think AFPM's constituents are viewed as being reluctant participants in sustainability and and making forward progress. What role does AFPM play in this space? We mentioned kind of the overall roles that AFPM plays, and I think those apply here. Advocate, educate, and inform our members. They're faced with that kind of stigma of where we're at in sustainability. And I think AFPM's taken a really big role in kind of promoting what our industry is doing. Just two years ago, we issued our first industry-wide sustainability report. And instead of focusing, there are some very specific metrics. For example, you mentioned GHG. We show the reduction in GHGs that our industry has been part of by adopting new technologies, things like that. But what we also took the approach of is to tell a little bit more of a story. So AFPM's sustainability report is mirrors our sustainability pillars. And our pillars, there's four of them. There's environmental stewardship. So kind of within our fence line, what can we protect as far as emissions and things of that nature, plastic waste, things of that nature. Health and safety, it would be the second pillar, which is protecting the people that work for us, but also the communities that surround us. The third pillar would be thriving people and communities. And that's more of kind of the philanthropic or building up the areas we're in. We pay a ton of taxes that are then used to facilitate growth in our communities. And then the last one was, it's a little bit more amorphous, but I think very important is driving progress. So what are products, for example, plastics are used in a variety of things like solar panels or windmills or light weighting a car. So what do our products do that make other products better? Um, So as I mentioned, two years ago, we issued our first sustainability report. And these include a lot of narratives, like the stories of our members, what they're actually doing in these four different areas. And so I was really proud to be kind of a part of that. And then just this past March, we issued that second report. So we'll continue to do that. On the policy side, we do advocate for policies that we think improve sustainability. On the fuel side, we advocate for higher octane fuels that are the equivalent to electric vehicles in a lot of situations as far as the overall life cycle uh, footprint. And on the plastic side, we've been a big advocate for advanced recycling. We understand traditional recycling is part of it, but to meet some of the lofty goals that consumer brands have, we're going to need to pair that traditional recycling with advanced recycling. And we feel like we have the experts on both sides, whether it be our experts in refining or petrochemical side to solve some of these really complicated challenges. 
there's other things too, like carbon capture that our members are very interested in, hydrogen. So I think the idea that sustainability isn't ingrained into our culture is not totally accurate. And I encourage everybody to go to our website and check out the sustainability reports we put out because they tell a really good story. And one of the things I've seen is as refineries have shut down and something like 75 refineries have shut down since 1991. I know that because I just spoke on that recently to somebody. But one of the things I think that's interesting is that those facilities are then getting turned into renewable diesel, other things. So it's an evolution of assets and products and how to better engage with consumers and constituents in a way that fits the current needs of our world. We get announcements, you hear them every day, whether it's sustainable jet fuel or biodiesel, our members are constantly looking at ways to make better and cleaner fuels. And I think that won't stop. I think that has to continue. Absolutely. So how does AFPM work with ACC and other industry groups? There's a number of them out there that touch chemical companies, chemical distributors. And this is always one of my great mysteries into the inner workings of industry groups. How do you guys team up together? It sounds like in the case of the Maritime, you let NACD and others maybe were in the lead, but how do you work that out? We have a good relationship with the, and not just the associations themselves, but the staff. We understand where some associations might be better suited on an issue than others. We talk quite frequently, and a perfect example is the rail issues. If you look at a lot of these proposals in front of the Surface Transportation Board, a lot of them will file comments jointly. And that requires a lot of collaboration, not just uh, amongst the staff of the associations, but the membership. An example is the Fertilizer Institute, a American Chemistry Council, and AFPM put together a proposal on that first and final mile rail data. We worked really hard over a period of, I guess, between six and 12 months and had a real robust proposal, and we're hoping to see that through. And the bottom line is, I think, just having that relationship and realizing that the more voices, the better in a lot of these discussions. Advanced recycling is another great example. There's a lot of pushback on that. While ACC is out there talking about it, with AFPM out there talking about it too, hopefully we can change some minds and kind of give people the information they need to make an informed decision. So I think while there is a number of trade associations, we work well together, and I think we'll continue to do so to kind of make sure our industry is strong and stays that way. Awesome. And advanced recycling seems to be gaining more acceptance as you keep seeing state by state, I guess, policies or agreement, whatever we want to call it. You guys, you would know better than I, but state by state agreement, it seems to support advanced recycling, which is needed, right? We can't get to the world of the future without making some changes. There is a recent McKinsey report that put a number on it that said without X number of growth in the advanced recycling industry, you're not going to meet the targets that you need to get. You know, consumer brands are putting goals out there. They want 100% recycled content to, and to, to provide that supply, you're going to need both mechanical and chemical. So we'll continue to push for that. So what's next on AFPM's agenda in 2022? What else are you guys focusing in on or what should we be looking for? So I think of the big issues that are facing our association and probably many associations, the Security Exchange Commission's new reporting requirements, they're proposed right now for environmental social governance issues. That's something our members are very interested in. I'm not as involved in it at AFPM, but the renewable fuel standard is always a major issue for us. On the rail side, I think, as I mentioned, now more than ever momentum. So I can see that some of those kind of crossing the finish line and breaking the tape the rest of this year. So that's definitely a couple of things off the top of my mind that we're looking at. And then I think the advanced recycling, I think you mentioned states. I think 18 states now have passed rules that kind of treat advanced recycling as a manufacturing process as opposed to like a waste or incineration process. And I think pushing that on a federal level would be really important to get a federal program that recognizes and kind of instead of a patchwork of different states doing so. And then the last thing I mentioned on the petrochemical side, one thing we're also looking at is the United Nations Environmental Assembly is pursuing a global plastic treaty. At the end of May, there's going to be the first meeting of those groups. So AFPM definitely will be involved in those conversations and working to make sure that plastic treaty considers the benefits of advanced recycling, things like that. Yeah, that's going to be impactful, right? We need to make sure that it's handled and approached appropriately and gets all points of view in there. Well, Rob, thank you. I appreciate you taking time to talk with me today and appreciate you joining us on The Chemical Show. Thank you. It's great being here. We've come to the end of today's podcast. We hope you enjoyed your time with us and want to learn more. 
simply visit thechemicalshow.com for additional information and helpful resources. Join us again next time here on The Chemical Show with Victoria Meyer.